Okay. All right, and everybody can see my, my screen then again, right? Cool. Yep. All right, perfect. So let, let, let's keep our conversation going. I apologize, I, I uh, vanished, had a vanish last week, um, but all things are good now in my household. We have a working refrigerator, you know, modern conveniences, all that, all that excitement, um, uh, good times. So um, we, we started talking last week. So, so we've, we've done our first pass at, at an assessment, right? A field site assessment. But I've, I've paused for the time being our, um, what would you do the final bit of that, which is the, the restoration part of it, right? What you'd actually propose. And so that's what I wanna keep talking about uh, today. Last week, we talked a bit about um, uh, historical stuff and sort of coming up, how might, how might we think about conceptually about figuring out uh, what a, uh, a target could be, what the, what the historic conditions would be, et cetera. And, um, and so I want to continue that, continue that flavor. So how we might go about starting our plan for our restoration. And let me just check real quick. Somebody's... Uh, Somebody's a little bit loud, so let me just mute. Make sure, make sure everybody's muted, if you guys wouldn't mind, so that we don't have any background noise. Give me a sec here. Let's see who might be talking. I'm just gonna mute Brian. I don't know if that's you that's making the sound, but uh, just check real quick. Uh, cool, cool, cool. Okay, so I think everybody else looks like they're muted. So cool. Um, and again, you guys absolutely unmute to ask questions and stuff. I just want to make sure we don't have any. Uh, excessive background noise. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so let's get back to uh, uh, starting our restoration uh, plan. Uh, so again, last time we talked about uh, reference sites in the conceptual level and, and how we might use um, existing monitoring or, or, or beginning some monitoring to um, uh, inform our, our ideas. And I wanna keep that, that going here going to talk about um, a couple quick examples and then get into a very specific one um, about oak trees. Oak trees aren't, aren't the classic thing you might think about in terms of wetland restoration. But, um, I think this example is um, a, a useful one in terms of how uh, conceptually how we might go about um, figuring out what, what our targets should be or, or how we might initially start to plan or frame our restoration. So again, we already talked about those first couple things last week. Um, before I get into the specifics of oak trees, I want to talk about um, different ways that we, uh, you know, can approach restoration. And here's an interesting one. And so this is using, um, I would call this uh, a semi-quantitative or or qualitative approaches to what we might want to do. And some, and and neither, none of these approaches is necessarily better or worse than the others. All these approaches. Um, have utility in different contexts and in different sites and in different uh, locations and times, right? So the reality is we'd love to be able to apply all of these techniques as we're getting, as we're beginning to think about what, what should this restoration site do or, or what does it need to do or how can we make it successful, et cetera. Um, and the reality is these are all just different arrows in our quiver. And we need to have many arrows in our quiver because um, we always walk into unknown situations. We don't know what the right um, answer is. And so by having more arrows, we're more likely to be successful and more likely to have um, effective uh, movement towards um, useful conservation. Okay, this is one of my favorite examples. This is an example from Elkhorn Slough up in the Monterey Bay area. So the Elk Elkhorn is um, essentially dead center in the middle of um, Monterey Bay. If you looked at Monterey Bay and you imagine the bay itself as a cookie bite, you know, out of the coast, it's essentially in the dead center of that bite. So um, now, so we, we, we have various syst uh, uh, cool systems in that area, but right in the middle, again, is, is where this river system drains the, the inland area from Salinas and the Central Valley um, and, and dumps out into the coast, which is going to become uh, right offshore is the Monterey Canyon. So this is a really, really important system historically. This is where John Steinbeck was um, was born and 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 set many of his novels and and all that great stuff. It's where we have a huge amount of coastal agriculture, like we do here in Ventura County. Um, it's an area where you know Monterey was the original 
um, uh, capital when when California is being colonized by the Spanish. This is our so there's all kinds of really interesting things going on in this area, uh, ecologically, historically, um, uh, and so forth. So uh, Elkhorn Slough wetland. What's a slough? A slough is basically one type of of wetland where we have essentially slow, generally speaking, slow moving water um, uh, as it as it uh, comes from the source before it goes into the receiving body, be that a lake or a uh, ocean uh, or a chunk of the ocean. Okay, so here's our slough. So um, what might we do? Well, uh, Elkhorn Slough has been hugely transformed uh, and hugely manipulated over the years, as you can imagine, right? So uh, native, native peoples were there. Uh, we had the early colonial history there. We had uh, the missions there. We had agriculture spinning up. We had uh, the economy of, of sort of the early proto California state going on there. We had military powers there. All these things were going on that had impacts on uh, Elkhorn Slough. Right now, Elkhorn Slough is, um, or, or the mouth of it is home to a fishing port, a fishing harbor, and home to the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, one of the premier um, oceanic, especially deep water oceanic uh, research uh, 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 in institutions in the world. So all kinds of interesting things have gone on there, have transformed this wetland system. So let me take you on a little bit of a um, tour here. Now, when we talk about uh, what we might think about with, with the restoration, as we mentioned last time, history is, is a frequent guide or history is a frequent thing we turn to, uh, totally uh, fine and totally uh, legitimate. Um, but uh, we don't always have great historical resources. Here is a really cool historical resource. Now this one here on the upper left I'm talking about, this is a painting. This is a painting um, uh, just in a, in a church, just a little bit inland from the slough in Castroville, where um, uh, they're, they're, they're the, one of the, they claim they're the artichoke capital of, of the world. Um, and uh, uh, their other claim to fame is uh, Marilyn Monroe was once Miss Artichoke or whatever it was called, Miss, Miss, Miss Festival or something. Um, so relatively small town, relatively sleepy town, agricultural um, area. Um, and uh, back in the early days of our of statehood, um, California was as now sort of this mythic place, this iconic place and drew people in from all around the world. And one of the folks that drew in was this this European painter. He came on over and he was essentially a, a homeless dude, right? Essentially a, a vagabond, a, 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 a dude that was hiking around to see the world as it were. And so what he would do is he would say, hey, I'd like to uh, trade my uh, services for some painting or, or, or for some room and board. So if you guys need any artwork or need any painting, I'm happy to do a painting for you if you give me a little bit of food or you'd let me stay here for a few weeks, that kind of deal. And so the church agreed and the church said, why don't you paint a mural of our area? And he said, okay. And so he spent um, many weeks and ultimately created this uh, piece here, which is dated to 1890. And this is a pretty interesting piece because again, this is very, this area, if you've not been to this part of the state of California, it's very similar to Ventura County where we have this flat agricultural plain and then surrounded by these these mountains these these, these coastal uh, ridges and so um what what this guy painted was not just a typical landscape which could be useful i suppose in and of itself <clears throat> but rather um a, a semi-aerial uh a view and uh, so it has some interesting things so now what do we take away from? Well, let me ask you guys. What, what, what do you take away from this painting from 1890? Any any ideas or any any observations here that we might glean? Looks like there's not much modification of the wetland so far. Okay, possibly. Okay, good. And so. Uh, okay, so, so the, we can still see something that resembles a wetland, let's say. Okay, cool. What else? There's hardly any industry, no buildings, no ag, just natural. Yeah, well, I would say there's a, there seems to be a lot of ag up here, but you're right. There isn't any, there doesn't look like to be any industrial drains um, 
dumping, I suppose, like what we consider modern pollution sources dumping into the estuary. Okay, cool. Other observations. You see uh, that the estuary kind of makes that L shape when it enter when it like hits the ocean. So that means it's healthy. Excellent. So there you go. So as we talked about in Malibu, um, again, as a reminder, when I first looked at these systems, I thought and I saw that the L shaped bend, in other words, we look down from an aerial view and it looks like the so the top of the image is the fresh water coming in and if the ocean is the bottom of our of our frame of reference, the inland waters tend to come and then make that L shape parallel the coast before connecting um, with the ocean. And I thought that was highly manipulated, but this again, correct, as you guys correctly observe, this is the more the natural system. So you can see here, if you guys can see my cursor. So here's the, here's the, the rivers coming in, river meandering, meander river, 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 river. It's actually another uh, river here, but, but so the river's coming in, meshes here. There isn't, it's not going into the ocean right here, right? If we look, it sort of keeps going down here, keeps going down here. And then um, he doesn't show the connection, but the connection is, is when it does break, just like we saw at Malibu, it's gonna tend to break down over here, right? So that's cool, that's interesting. Um, and so, so that's saying, hey, th this knowing what we know, this system looks relatively healthy from a coastal sediment perspective, from a littoral um, movement of sediment perspective. Um, other, other observations or other insights maybe we can well, first of all, can you tell me what rivers those are uh it's the salinas river and i can't remember the other one okay uh, the other one is uh the one that's up uh comes off of um by the 17 freeway i i have i'll double check i double check i should know number but but this but right so but this main sucker uh the important thing is it's coming from the interior part of um of California from the, essentially from the Central Valley area, just like the Santa Clara River in our case is coming from, um, you know, it, it's coming from way beyond the coastal plain. It's bringing water from, through essentially this crack, if you will, in the coastal mountain range, which is the same thing here. Other, other ideas or other thoughts? There's different zones or layers of land to Good. differentiate different places of the wetland. Good, good, good. So we have, so we have, for example, the the sandy beach here, right? The 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 um, sand dunes and sandy beach. We have some kind of uh, low, uh, what is most likely salt marsh around here, and, and probably around here. So this low lying area right next to the uh, water, and then we have this sort of transition area where we have some of these uh, small bluffs, <clears throat> hills or bluffs. We have some heavily vegetated areas along the riparian corridor type thing. And it looks like we have some of these areas that the riparian corridor extends all the way into the salt marsh and other areas maybe, or other stretches maybe not quite as much riparian, maybe suggesting some of the people have already cleared that perhaps. Um, we have some, some what looks to be like salt flats or mud flats uh, around here too. So good, so we have these different regions, excellent. Other, other observations? Okay, so um, so all those are, are good. All those are helpful insights, I would say. One of the ones that's most interesting to me is there is a little footbridge uh, here, um, which I think you can you can see right here, or a, a little a small bridge, right? So you know if if we're again not saying that this painting was was painted to be you know a a, a quantitative record of the time. But I think it, we can make some reasonable assumptions, right? So the reasonable, there's a, there's a lot of agricultural efforts going on up here. So um, we see some kind of steam puff, 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 puff. That's probably a, a train or what have you. Um, we see uh, uh, the bluffs is mostly cleared. So if we can see here, we have some, some indication of sort of natural vegetation. Then we hit here and it's looking like it's sort of a, a crops, right? Some kind of wheat or oat or barley or something of that nature, right? So, so we've transformed the, the sort of tabletops of these coastal bluffs, but not so much the sides of the coastal bluffs, not so much the main waterway areas, right? So we do have this little bridge thing over here, which we can see from this photo in 1882, okay? But also check it out right here, we have 
Um, so another way to get across this water, because again, big body of water, uh, uh, in theory, you can throw a rock over or something, or maybe if you needed to get across, you could easily swim, but for any kind of serious commerce or, or movement of materials, that's gonna be a, a real barrier. So one of the things we see here is essentially a little um, a, a mini dock or little uh, pier as it were. And then we have this um, uh, um, ferry that is, it looks like there's a, a horse maybe and a, and a horse and carriage on it. And so these folks are going crossing the river with this ferry. So that tells us that there's um, you know, people crossing this, but we don't yet have large hydrological messing up going on. We don't have large bridges. We don't seem to have large dikes. We don't have large uh, barriers to the flow of water yet in this, in this uh, late 1800s period. Cool? All right, so, so we can glean a lot from some of these historic photos. So for example, if we, wanted, if we were charged with doing a restoration here, we might say, ah, and we were using, and we wanted to use history as a guide, we'd say, ah, so it looks like there was some extensive dune systems in this area, yeah? Looks like there was some um, extensive salt marsh things in, or elements in this area. Um, and it looks like the riparian corridor extended pretty darn close to the, to the mouth of the, of the ocean, right? So to, the, to the mouth of the river um, and, uh, and, and so forth, right? So we can, we can glean some of that kind of stuff. We can also start to get a sense of when did the hydrology or when was there massive um, alterations to the, the structure of this system, right? So 1890, we're beginning to see a little bit of this. We probably are seeing some agricultural runoff, maybe some poop or some manure from the cows or maybe going into the water, maybe creating a little bit of elevated nutrients, things of that nature, possibly, maybe, maybe not, but, but potentially. But it really starts taking off um, just after this, the era or, or just around the era of this painting, right? So by 1882, we're seeing more, um, more structures going in. Um, uh, by 1900, we're seeing large scale transformations. So right now we don't see any evidence of um, widespread diking or draining of the wetlands. But by 1900s, we're beginning to see that. What is this? So this is a salt production facility. So to produce salt, one of the easiest, you, we get salt, salt from a couple of ways. One, we can mine salt. We can go to find an area uh, that has a geological deposit of salt and, and excavate salt. The other main way we produce salt for commercial purposes is through areas like this, which are salt flats. And so in this case, what, what, or what you do is you basically create an area of, say this area where we have some, some um, salt water entering, uh, relatively flat land. So a river mouth is, is a classic place where people will do this or around a delta or estuary. And they'll, we will, um, uh, smooth out the ground and make it just a little bit lower than um, sea level or make it a little bit higher and wait for high tide um, and then create some type of gated structure. So right now, as we can see, floodwaters can come into this area and go everywhere. So when the water rises, it goes this way, it goes that way, it goes every which way. So what you do in this case is you'd wanna constrain the water and only allow the water in when you wanted it to come in. So we'd create little dams and a dam that doesn't cross uh, the main flow of the water, but is rather on the sides of flow, we refer to as a dike or a levee. And so we, we dike off these areas, we create mounds, and then we allow the water in and then close it off. So then, then create a, a gate or, or a valve or somehow turn it off and then allow that seawater to sit there, the hot sun, evaporates the water, what's left behind is the salt. And so then you can go and scrape up the salt and sell it for, for seasoning for your foods or for chemical processes or whatever. So that's what's going on here. So what we see is, now this is uh, uh, you know over 120 years ago. So this is the old technology. Now we use things like tractors and automated belts and things. But back in the day, you can see what they've done is they've created these little ditches or these little uh, dikes and they have this seawater in these little areas, and then they're they're essentially uh, scraping it up and piling it up, and they get these piles of salt. So that that's highly modif. We're highly changing the dynamics of those estuaries, and obviously, if it's full of um, water generating salt, it's great for 
bacteria that love hypersaline conditions, but short of that, it's not good for animals. It's not good for most plants, right? It's, it's not um, an ideal situation for most of the uh, wetland organisms we're interested in. That process of beginning to change the land, as we talked about before, the notion of reclamation and this notion of wetlands as bad things and as, as having value when we can transform them into a more terrestrial type context, this continues on. So this notion of diking, constraining, changing the wetlands continues into 1915. And now we've cut off this salt marsh area. So we've essentially added more flat terrestrial land. And we see this gentleman here is, is grazing his cattle. So we've turned this area from a wetland into a, um, a livestock support area. Um, and things continue on to the 1950s, 1950s. We have the introduction of, of what Nathan was mentioning there. And like he said, we don't see any major pollution sources going in. Now we see, um, and now the way you can find this if you're driving around the coast or whatever, you just look for the classic sm uh, three smokestacks that are there, which is the Moss Landing power plant. Um, and it's changed over the years to change ownerships, but basically it's been there since the 1950s using the water of the estuary to be sucked in to use as coolant um, in this electrical power plant. Um, and that's going on. And then by, by the early 2000s, the estuary was in significant, um, was having, having lots of problems. So we were measuring areas of um, loss of the salt marsh, for example, measured on the tidal channels as much as a meter a, day, a, meter a year, excuse me. And so, um, so this area is highly transformed and this area now is intensely uh, uh, developed, intensely uh, intense agriculture going on, mostly strawberry fields around it now and, and highly channelized all, all the, the classic issues we have with altered hydrology. So that's a quick example of how we could use historical documents, right? So this, there's, there's no measurement, there's no species list here. There's nothing else. We've just gone and found some historic paintings, some historic images that have informed our, our understanding. We can also use, uh, as we saw last time, uh, more qu historic quantitative stuff. And in this case, this was the US, co uh, uh, the, the geological survey, the coastal survey of, um, uh, for navigate, originally for navigation purposes, but we can use it to get an insight into some of our coastal wetlands. And this is now looking again, back down by us here in Ventura County of uh, wetland extent uh, uh, currently versus historically. So we can, there's a lot of a lot we can glean from looking at historic things. And then we also talked about last time the value of looking at indicators and looking at uh, measuring current uh, communities and seeing what the abundance of say insects are uh, in our particular area. As we move on to think about, and as you guys start to think about how might you conceptually think about designing your restoration, um, one of the first things you're gonna to wanna to do is continue this thought process. So who was here or who is here or maybe who should be here? You can think of that in terms of, in terms of the, is, is that, that makes sense so far what we're talking about you guys, just before I go on to talk about this, that makes sense so far about the, how we might use some of these historical documents, image resources, et cetera? Yeah. yeah. Any questions about that? Okay, so um, so again, you you've been challenged. Hey, go go tell me what we should do for this site. Okay, first thing is maybe who is here, who is here now, who maybe could be here in the future realistically, and so that usually is going to be um, looking at a couple different things. Um, and while these things don't have to be broken down this way, I think this is a, a useful way in how many people tend to approach doing restorations. One is looking at the ecological dynamics of the system, the ecological setting, and the other is to look at the, the human setting. And I wanna set aside all the comments that yes, humans are part of nature and all this and that, yes, but, but for the purposes of planning, it's, it's, it's helpful to maybe consider these as, as separate, acknowledging that these things are of course uh, influence one another and it and it's, can be difficult to separate the two, but, but okay. So the ecological systems, from a, from a restoration planning point of view, Oftentimes we first wanna talk about what the organismal component is. So the critters, plants and animals, or the functions, the processes that are gonna be going on here that we wanna recover. A uh, storm surge protection, uh, uh, high productivity, that type of stuff. And then in terms of the human spheres, 
um, the ecosystem services. And recall, when we talk about ecosystem services, those are, they're, they're, there are two flavors of ecosystem services. There's the functions and the values. And the functions are, are the biogeochemical goings on. The values are the worth that we ascribe to them in our society. And so that's, I'm specifically talking about in this context, the value aspect of ecosystem services. And related to that, but, but still I think worth having a distinct conversation is what the local community desires or needs or benefits. And this will be highlighted. Um, we saw a little bit of that in Malibu. We visited Malibu. We'll see this even more when we go talk about Ash, when we go visit um, Ash Avenue in Carpinteria next week. Um, so, okay, so the ecological stuff, the human stuff, Ecological stuff usually broken down into to the, the, the individuals themselves or the organisms themselves, and then the functioning and the human spheres, some of the ecosystem services, which maybe are not necessarily individual focused, but more sort of community, society, ec economic focused. Whereas the community desires, needs and benefits, that's really much more of a focus with individual community members. What do you need? What, what do you like to see in this site or, or what do you remember seeing in this site, et cetera? Okay, and so I want to illustrate um, uh, an example of, uh, again, looking at how we might guide our restoration or how we might inform our restoration with something that's essentially in, a little bit in between, in between this, this uh, qualitative or, or maybe in between this, this historical quantitative and, um, and uh, uh, a measurement uh, type, type thing. Okay, so let's talk, so I want to talk about California uh, oaks here as the example. And we've already seen this, so I've grayed out the part that doesn't matter for this initial part, but just remember that um, our oak woodlands, just like our other systems have been radically transformed in the last 150 years since California became a state. And uh, I mentioned in the context of this, the example I'm gonna use is from the San Francisco Bay Area. So I just wanna highlight that we've lost something at least on the order of 71% of our oak woodlands. And I don't remember if I said this or not last time. Let me just go to one more slide. Um, uh, even though these things are transformed, we can still glean something from existing, um, the existing state. And so with this exercise, I'm gonna show you guys is using the historical stuff and trying to blend it with the current situation and see if we can merge those two to provide some guidance for us for our restoration. So this is a, one of our, uh, this is an example of some of the coastal foothills south of the San Francisco Bay Area. And, and uh, uh, even though these things are, are impacted by various things, fires, et cetera, um, there's still some things we can glean. Anything you guys glean, anything, any observation you guys can make from this or any, anything notable from this photo here, just from, you know, a thousand feet in the air. Anything look look uh, noteworthy to you, or any pattern looks noteworthy to you? There's more vegetation on one side versus the other. Yes, exactly. So, so um, here we have uh, uh, this this side. We don't we don't know exactly what side it is. It doesn't matter for the purpose of this. It actually is the side that um, is is more northern reaching. But in any event, um, so this side is more grassy, right? This side is more um, wooded, right? So that seems to be showing up both in terms of the, the big uh, picture here, the big ridges, but also on the small ridges, we see what seem to be a similar pattern there too. Um, so that's, so that's interesting. We also can tell there's been a lot of, there, there's seems to be a lot of use in this area because we have these, these roads that appear to be, or dirt roads that appear to be um, pretty, uh, pretty consistent and clear. Um, okay, so so uh, I was gonna say one more thing. So the general pattern, just I don't think I mentioned this when I talked about this last time, but the general pattern that we've seen with grasslands, oak woodlands, et cetera, is our grasslands, generally speaking, on the flatter areas, say the valley floors, okay? Our oak woodlands tend to be on the the lower re reaches of the the foothills, so so the the low slopes, right? Then as you go higher up, you get into more forested vegetation. Technically, when we say woodland, there's actually a definition for what we mean by woodland versus forest. Woodland is um, woody, a woody community that isn't quite as dense as a forest. So it's usually 70% or less cover on average. 
that doesn't matter for us. For, but we'll just talk about grasslands is historically on the on the valley floors along with our wetlands, right? Because that's where the water is going to accumulate, um, wetlands and grasslands. Uh, then as we sit, tend to go up in elevation, we tend to hit this, this woodland uh, zone. And then as we go higher up, we get into more forested areas and more mountainous areas. The gross pattern in California and indeed most of human civilization has been to move in and take over the flatland. That's the easiest places to, those are the easiest places to live, easiest places to transform, easiest places to farm, easiest places to put a home on, et cetera. And so generally speaking, we, we filled in the grasslands, we nuked the grasslands pretty quickly. Then um, oak woodlands, hey, we need fuel. So when people started chopping down wood for fuel and other things, then we started denuding the oak woodlands. And so in a sense, what we've done is we've, we've kind of, um, not only have we, have we destroyed a lot of these systems, we've, we've, we've changed them in, in, uh, to greater and lesser degrees in areas where humans have settled. So when grasslands have persisted, they've tended to have to go up a little bit onto the hillsides. Where oak woodlands have persisted, they've tended to have to have moved up a little bit in elevation. And so, so there's a sort of a serial depletion that's going on or, the, or this serial shifting of communities. So even though all that's happening, even though all that may, may or may not have happened in this particular area, we can still see the pattern that you guys correctly observed. So a little bit about oaks here. Uh, they're, they're very diverse. Um, they frequently hybridize. Um, uh, and we have tree and shrub oak species. Um, there's at least 20 species of tree oaks in California and at least 16 species, probably a lot more of shrub oaks in California. Let's just talk about, to keep it simple, we're just gonna talk about tree oaks here. And these are the sort of um, ones that uh, are probably most relevant to a, a coastal wetland restoration. And um, I'm gonna even nuke those out and, and really, the 90% of the, the plantings of oak woodlands in our, in our coastal areas here in Southern California are gonna be coast live and valley oak. They're, again, there are 20 species, there's blue oaks, there's, there's Engelman oaks, there's all kinds of oak trees that um, you might want to introduce into your restoration for diversity reasons or others. But, but if you're gonna put in an oak woodland, most of the oaks that people are gonna plant are gonna to tend to be uh, live oaks and val or valley oaks. Um, uh, yes, and, and it goes without saying, um, these are all of the same, from the same uh, genus of Quercus. Um, oaks set acorns, and that's one of the main uh, uh, aspects of their ecology. They set a lot of acorns. They produce a lot of of, of reproductive structures. Birds eat these, squirrels eat these, humans eat these. Um, uh, the, the meal we make from acorn, uh, uh, crushed acorns was a key staple for many of our um, Native Americans that lived in this area for thousands of years, uh, all kinds of cool stuff. Interestingly, and especially in the context of restoration, um, for many oak species, the acorn set is not related to what the most recent environmental conditions uh, were. Most of our plants, hey, we get a really good winter, we get some good rains, we get some good conditions, and it's going to flower, it's going to set seed or whatever, you know, a lot in the, say, spring or, or, or su spring, summer or fall, right? With oaks, they, many of them are tied to the conditions two years ago. So the rainfall two years ago is a better predictor of, um, of the, the reproductive output of this year. So that might have something to do with your, with your thought process in terms of your uh, um, uh, looking at the success of this system. Um, and, and again, why, why, why oak trees? We're talking about oak trees here. Well, one, because I think it's just a nice example to run through intellectually. But also, um, I think we, we sometimes don't consider trees as often in the context of our wetlands, unless we're talking about something like our swamp restorations in uh, Louisiana or you know, bottomland hardwood forest, that kind of stuff. 
Um, but even here in, in coastal Southern California, trees are a key part of wetlands, maybe not in the middle of our wetlands, but certainly as framers of wetlands, on the edges of wetlands, on the riparian corridors, bringing water into our systems. And they're quite important because they actually add um, a lot of three-dimensional structure <clears throat> that can help with things like wind and, and provide habitat for birds, et cetera. So, so, th so these are, this is relative to, uh, re or, or relevant to our wetland work as well. And this is a, a great uh, Bierstadt from um, the late, or the mid 1800s. Um, uh, lots of critters uh, use oaks, in and around oaks. This is a bobcat from in, around one of my planted oaks. Um, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, critters, coyotes, birds, etc. So, so there's, a, there's a huge community that, that utilize oaks as either um, temporary refuge, as primary habitat, as a food source, um, etc. So here we're looking at um, some of some of our oak species, and here are the, here are the two that were most uh, that I mentioned are kind of our our white lab rats for oak restoration. The one on the left is a uh, valley oak. Um, and, and the genus of the valley, or the species of the valley oak is Quercus lobata. And so you can see they're lobed. So valley oaks are very, um, uh, very um, uh, uh, frilly looking, right? They have these, these huge lobes that go on on their leaves. And uh, Quercus agrifolia or live oak here is, is historically more of a ovoid leaf shape and has a lot of little prickly um, pseudo thorns on the edges. Um, now these, we can see uh, a lot of variety of these, um, uh, even on the, these are all from the same tree, right? So, so this guy has a, has a lot, this guy has maybe not so much. This guy has some, some poke, some, some thorns on the edge. This one's much more smooth, um, et cetera. So there's, there's a, a, a high degree of plasticity in oaks, both across the species, across the, 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 the genus, but also across individuals, even, you know, well, individuals in the same population, but even even different sides of a tree potentially on one individual. So they're very, uh, very um, uh, changeable in terms of how they present. Here's a classic image of a mature oak tree, which makes these classic, it makes this classic sort of mushroom or dome shaped. But then, uh, you know, many, many, and so this, this is a, this is, I believe, this is a valley oak. I can tell from just looking at it. And uh, this is more of a live oak, which, this is a live oak, which tends to have more of a, um, it can form those kind of big mushroom canopies, but, but valley oaks classically do, live oaks are, tend to be much more messy, kind of more bleh, 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 growing every which way. Okay, um, coast live oak seedlings, here's a, here's a seedling right here. And so here's that acorn, the little acorn is germinated, he's thrown down a root and he's thrown up a shoot. And this, this would be a, a seedling that, that is, is doing well and, and, and germinated and is starting to grow. Um, there's also uh, all kinds of things that sometimes people confuse with acorns. This is obviously, uh, and which kind of oak is this, you guys? Valley. Valley, valley. okay, good, valley oak, right? Got the, got all the lobes, Quercus lobata. Um, and so these things look like, uh, look like they might be seeds or something, right? In fact, we call these oak apples. And these, anybody know what these are or what causes these? Those are made by wasps, correct? That's right. So these are uh, an insect that has parasitized these, uh, or this tree and essentially used the genetics of the larvae, the genetics of the insect to take over the genetics of the tree. And so uh, this, in this case, this particular species, it's growing these big giant uh, structures inside of which the larvae will live a farm of fungus and feed off the fungus, all kinds of cool stuff. So we'll see these a lot in trees and people will sometimes think they're, they're uh, um, a reproductive structure, but no, all oaks set, um, set acorns. And here's one of my planted tree species and you can see it's loaded one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. So this is a relatively young tree, but it, it's still covered with these, um, these uh, uh, so-called oak apples. Okay. Uh, here's some here's some valley oaks just starting to germinate. You can see the right here, right here. But this one is the easiest. You're just starting to see the cotyledon come on out. Uh, already saw this. This is the coast live, as I mentioned. And so what we hope with uh, with our restorations is we plant these 
these individuals and they start to grow, right? So here's one of my um, planted oaks after about three years of age. And it's, you know, about two feet tall or so. Here's one of my oaks after about 10 years of growth. And so uh, much more, much taller. This is now over my head in terms of height. And it's starting to have these, these, these branching patterns, right? These classic branching patterns. Um, and so great. So that would be, you know, success. This, these, these are live oaks. Um, but more often than not, this is what we see. This is what we see when we plant an oak. So here's an acorn that started to grow and it died and it didn't make it. So failed recruitment is a key thing. And as we talk about planning for restorations, um, and if we think maybe oaks are important, um, we really want to understand why oaks germinate, why they don't, why they successfully um, establish, why they don't. And so that's what I want to mention here. So I showed okay. you this picture. Oh yeah, sorry, go ahead. Um, aren't, aren't these trees basically like live alone? Aren't they happier if they just have a lot of space around them and no, no other trees, no other oaks even? Oh, great question. So once we get to, once we get to sort of like this stage, adult stage, uh, yeah, this oak would prefer there to be no shading on its leaves, right? So check out all the, all, it, let's get in sun from all these different directions, right? Um, any water, uh, or if it's foggy, all oaks are great at um, trapping that fog and having that fog sort of rivel down their, their trunks and then, and then they can, uh, you know, utilize that water. Um, so, so this guy would love it to be, have no competitors around. So all the water, you know, she would get all this light she would get, right? All that kind of good stuff. But, but that's as, that's as an adult, right? When they're young, actually, that's not necessarily the case because if we, if we look at, so if we look at, uh, this condition here, right? Check it out. This guy has got, or, or maybe this one's a better one, better example here. So we planted this individual. So we planted him right here and a cow comes along or a deer comes along or a vole comes along and says, oh, look, I'm, I'm kind of hungry for some from oak or I'm hungry for some tree bark or whatever I'm hungry for. Oh my God, look, here's an, here's an oak tree, right? Boop -a -doop -a -doop -a -doop. I'm going to be um, an easy target of those, of those critters. Um, so when we're young, there probably is a, a lot of benefit for having clumped plantings, for having individuals close to one another. Um, there's now not so much the case here, but in some of our other cases where we're doing things like in bottomland hardwood forest, there's also um, uh, some benefit, uh, some aerodynamic benefit. Um, and we see the same thing in rain, <clears throat> excuse me, rainforest per se. So if we can imagine a, a lone big tree growing here and it's super, super windy, that tree is gonna perceive a lot of wind shear, a lot of wind stress. And so if we had more of a canopy or more of a, a, of a community around us, that's gonna act to tend to reduce the, the stress. So um, long story short, what I'm saying is uh, there's benefits of having community members around you at different stages of your life history. Okay, so no. it would be a, a growing in a nurse with a nurse plant right near or within a nurse plant when it's little, and then as it grows, it, it outgrows the need for that nurse anymore. Yeah, sure. Yes. Yeah. Th okay. th that's one example. And so, so for example, when we we when you talk about uh, if you guys go to the store today and you bought some corn, let's say you wanted to plant some corn in your in your backyard, you would say. How, what's, what planting density do I want the corn at? And they'll say something on the packet. It'll say, plant a seed every 12 inches, plant a seed every 18 inches or, or, or whatever it is, right? Because they're talking about once you get your plant growing, yeah, and you want to have maximum corn production, you want that corn stalk to be getting as much sunlight as possible. And so we don't want a bunch of stalks shading one another and reducing the overall um, um, corn output of, of that individual, right? That's, that's, in a, that's in your backyard. That's in a highly managed, controlled um, system, yeah? In, uh, and, and, and so, and so that, 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 that makes sense. But another alternative is for you to plant a gazillion million uh, 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 
corn kernels or, or seeds, corn seeds, right? And they all start to grow up. And then once, once they grow up, maybe you could thin them. You could come in and you could artificially rip out, or not artificially, but you could rip out a certain number of those individuals, yeah? And so that you'd, you'd get the benefit of having a bunch of the corn together. So if a, um, not that this ever happened to me, rabbits, get into your yard, rabbits, and start to eat your food, rabbits, um, uh, even if they eat some of them, you still have others to pr th that would survive, right? And so you could do that thinning later. And so we could use a similar process in our restorations. And that's gonna depend upon how much investment you have. Maybe you could go in and plant a ton of, of oaks and then thin them out later. If, if you know that in two years or three years or whatever it's gonna be, you're gonna have the, the, the person power to do that, great. Maybe you only have a contract for six months, in which case, hmm, maybe I wanna space them out a little bit more. But, um, but sure, absolutely. A, a, a spacing concern is, is, a, is a, a real thing. And it's, there's real, a real art form to figuring out what the right spacing is, the right planting distance for our, our critters. So good question. Other questions about that so far? Okay, check in our time. I think I'm gonna go just a little bit more and then, um, and then we'll pause for our break. Okay, you guys, sound good? Sounds good. Okay, so um, okay, so the situation, you guys have to do a restoration. I want some oaks around my wetland restoration. Okay, cool. So what do I want to do? We understand that we've had continued destruction of our oak woodlands uh, throughout. Um, we've and and because of this thing here, because of this thing that we just saw, right? We could we could talk about relatively poor recruitment, meaning meaning relatively um, poor. Uh, survivorship or arrival of little babies of propagules and then surviving of those propagules into a certain life history stage. That's what we mean by recruitment, recruitment into the population. And so, so all those are a justification for why we need to do that. And so, um, so why are we having these problems, etc. cetera? Um, we have a long history of manipulating oaks in California, right? So um, John Muir talks about this. Um, all, many, many of our Native American uh, tribes had active, active manipulation of oak woodlands. So we talk about how, um, so, so right now, what's getting in the news a lot, which is fantastic, is the notion of traditional um, burning practices uh, uh, of Native peoples that were, um, you know, banned outright, they were made illegal, um, all kinds of stuff, but but that that approach, we're beginning to um, return to that and understand that these folks have a great, uh, oftentimes these folks have a fantastic understanding of the landscape dynamics of of California ecosystems and how to manipulate those. And so here we see a, a, an an image of a, a, a native person um, seeding the ground, right? So picking up acorns and maybe even planting acorns. We have uh, evidence of, of humans harvesting acorns, storing them for later in these granaries, right? So here's this, this image from 1877. Um, uh, and we have lots of evidence of shifted abundances of oaks uh, as we, as we more mo in a more modern sense, have changed their abundance and their distribution as measured by pollen that's accumulated in uh, uh, ponds and, and wetlands. Um, and, uh, and again, uh, so our iconic Yosemite, where, where John Muir spent so much time, that only looked that way because Native Americans intentionally burnt the valley floor over and over and over again every year. And indeed, John Muir and others would, and settlers would sometimes talk about in the early days of statehood, how there'd be a pall, there'd be a, there'd be a haze across the Central Valley of California because uh, when, it, when it was burning time, because so many native tribes were burning the grasslands in and around oak woodlands. Why did they burn? They burned primarily to take essentially what, what Loretta was talk, was asking about. They burnt to clear out grass. They burnt to clear out shrubs. They burnt to clear out competitors for the larger individuals. So those, those individuals would be bigger, more robust. So when it was time to do their acorn harvesting for their meals and stuff, they could go out and they could harvest in 20 minutes and get all the acorns they needed, right? Uh, because there were 
solitary, large, massive trees with huge acorn sets. Were they not to burn, there would still be tons of acorns around, but it would be, you'd have to go to this tree and then you'd have to walk over there to that tree and then you have to walk over there to that tree. So it was essentially convenience, right? It was essentially making it easier to, um, to uh, uh, get food um, in addition to other benefits from burning as well. But, um, but anyway, we know that we, have, we humans have been actively changing the, the, and influencing our oak communities for millennia. And again, I already, already ran through this. I won't spend time on this, but, but again, these are the photographs I found from back in the day. To, and this was from 1886. And this is this area where I'm gonna be talking about uh, next, but, but this is this area where we, we've had massive changes. In this case, you guys correctly identified that this was all this agriculture or, or uh, excuse me, livestock um, concentration and uh, having impacts on these uh, oak trees that surround this particular wetland. Okay, with that, I think we're up to our 10 minute break. I'm gonna pause this and we're gonna pick it up again and talk about how we might figure out um, what the right um, location to, to put oaks in could be, okay? So see everybody in 10 minutes. <laughs>